we wanted to treat it like any other crop because that's that's what it is and, and see how it's going to fit into a farmer's existing plan because the hope is that by incorporating hemp into your rotation, you'll be able to make a higher profit. That's Tara Caton, research coordinator and leader of the hemp research trials at the Rodale Institute in Kutztown, Pennsylvania. This is the Lancaster Farming Industrial Hemp Podcast. My name is Eric Harlock, and today we check in with Tara about the weed suppression and variety trials that the Rodale Institute has been conducting for the past three years. And then we're going to check in with Eric White. He's an organic hemp farmer from the Poconos who has definitely been experiencing damage from the European corn borer. We'll hear about that, plus some of his unique marketing plans for his hemp crop. All right, but first, a few other things. So on Monday of this week in Harrisburg, the Pennsylvania House Democratic Policy Committee held a public hearing on industrial hemp. They haven't published the complete video of the session yet. I have a request in for that, and hopefully we can can play some of that audio next week. But this hearing is noteworthy because it shows that the hemp industry is gaining traction and lots of attention here in the state. So for those of us who are already pretty deep into the hemp space, There probably wasn't a lot of new information, but people outside the industry learned a whole lot, and I think that's good for the industry in general. All right, next up. As you know, we are getting pretty close to the 2019 Pennsylvania Hemp Summit. That's happening October 7th and 8th at the Lancaster Convention Center in downtown Lancaster, where, you know, Monday night, Lancaster Farming is putting on the reception. And as I've mentioned before, we're going to tape a live episode of this podcast. So uh, with that in mind, I would like to give a shout out to the sponsors that are helping us put this reception together Monday night. We could not do this without your help. So a big shout out and thank you to Kimberton Whole Foods and Pocono Organics. And we have a couple of musical sponsors too. Um, Thank you very much for your help, Floyd's of Leadville and the Pennsylvania Hemp Industry Council. With everybody's help, we are going to put together a really fun and surprising and informative evening. So I hope to see you all there. Be sure to get your tickets ahead of time at teampa.com slash pahempsummit. There will be some tickets available at the door Monday evening for the reception. And here's a quick word from one of our musical sponsors. Hey everybody, this is Floyd Landis from Floyd's of Leadville, and we're proud to be sponsoring the music of Tin Bird Shadow at the Pennsylvania Hemp Summit on October 7th. Or 8th, or whatever it is. (laughs) Whatever the date is. Thank you, Floyd. Yes, it's October 7th uh, at 5.30 in Lancaster. Okay, so just one more thing before we get into my interview with Tara from the Rodale Institute. Uh, This past Sunday, I had the special pleasure of being a guest on The Folk Show on WXPN in Philadelphia with host Ian Zalator. This is the Folk Show on XPN. I'm Ian Zalator, and I'm joined uh, with uh, joined by Eric Herlock. Hello, oh, Ian. Hello. Hi. Thanks for having me down here today. Thanks for being down here. Ian was gracious enough to let me come down and talk about the Hemp Summit because you know, people who love music also might love industrial hemp. So, thank you, Ian. Big shout out to WXPN. And now the interview. Hi, Tara. Welcome to the Lancaster Farming Industrial Hemp Podcast. Could you introduce yourself for us, please? Yeah. So I'm Tara Keaton from the Rodale Institute. And here at the Institute, I'm the research coordinator, um, where I get to have the opportunity to work on all the projects and coordinate the day-to-day activities that happen in our research department, um, as well as the industrial hemp project lead. So I've really taken a a role in in making sure this work um, continues and see what we can learn about industrial hemp. Okay. And what, so you're in sort of the third year of a four-year trial. Can you talk about um, the research there at the Institute? Yeah, sure. Um, So we started in 2017 after the initial passing of the Farm Bill that allowed states to begin industrial hemp research pilot programs. And so that was passed and signed in 2016, and we were able to plant seed for the first time in over 80 years in Pennsylvania um, to begin this research in hopes and then kind of predicting what would potentially happen in this most recent farm bill um, where it had become legal to grow as a crop. And so kind of anticipating that, we wanted to take industrial hemp 
and treat it like a crop, right? We wanted to take what we know about the work we've been doing here for over 40 years, like in our farming systems trial, and see how we can incorporate hemp into that. Um, so we kind of took our typical organic grain rotation, and we wanted to see how hemp could fit in there. Um, we wanted to see if it could be used as a potential um, to fit into a grain rotation, to diversify this crop rotation, um, to provide some both agronomic and economic benefits by incorporating hemp into your rotation. And so that's that's what we did here. And so that, that's kind of our weed suppression trial is what we're calling that. And so that's using industrial hemp as a dual weed suppression cover crop and cash crop. Um, and so we're growing it over the summer season as a weed suppression cover crop, much like sorghum sedan grass to smother those weeds. Um, and then you have that short season crop that's able to get off in time to get your cover crops in and to benefit those other grain crops like corn, soybean, and wheat. Okay. Um, we also thought from what we knew about hemp, uh, because its ability to grow so tall, shade out those weeds naturally, and also because of its extensive root biomass, that it would have the potential to kind of break through that soil compaction layer and possibly be a tool to reduce tillage. And how do things look so far? Is that you know, is the research sort of going where you thought it would? Yeah, we've definitely had some great results with that goal. So we, in year one, we grew industrial hemp side by side with sorghum sedan grass to compare their uses as weed suppression cover crops. And both crops did a really good job at keeping that, you know, floor clean of weeds. Um, so that was really great to see. Um, and then, you know, of course, we're, we're still tracking soil, but it's, it takes years to kind of see changes in soil. So that's right. something that we'll continue to monitor. Um, but, and then we followed in year two with soybeans. But what we did before the soybeans is we split the field in half. In half the field, we use our typical rotational no-till approach mm -hmm. uh, where we are still using tillage to establish our cover crops. And then we use the no-till method with our roller crimper to roll down the cover crop and plant our cash crops. And so in half the field, we followed that typical rotation that we use at our farming systems trial and many other places on our farm where we used tillage to establish the rye cover crop. And the following spring, we rolled that down with the roller crimper and planted the soybeans behind. Okay. In the other half of the field, we directly drilled the rye into the hemp and sorghum stubble. So we're trying to reduce an instance of tillage in this case. Okay. Um, and then again in the spring, also rolled down the rye and planted the soybeans. And so we wanted to compare the two, doing a complete no-till system to a rotational no-till system. We know that complete no-till in organic is really hard, as tillage is the main tool for organic farmers to fight weeds. Right. Um, so you know, with that, we really wanted to see, we saw it because of the way that hemp grows so prolifically, like the, you know, just the sheer, I mean, just to paint a picture, these plants germinated for us in three days. And by the end of the week, um, they were, you know, knee height and by 10 days they were hip height. I mean, it's just unbelievable. And we harvested within 80 days and we had, you know, 10 to 12 foot plants. And so just that in that short window, that ability to produce that much of a canopy um, really isn't giving the weeds a chance. And so we saw really great results with weed suppression, but not only when hemp was growing, we saw a continued effect by having this type of rotation, by using other tools, um, you know, like using our roller crimper method and, and creating that mulch system to grow our cash crops in. Uh, we saw very, very low weed pressure in our soybeans in year two, which was unbelievable considering the amount of precipitation we had last year. Right. Uh, many of our fields on our farm and many other farms had complete crop loss because of the excess moisture um, and, and weed pressure. Right. And so we were really excited about that. But not only did we see reduced weed pressure, we saw increased yields in our soybeans in the plots where the sorghum and the hemp were growing. And this is in comparison, we did have control plots or fallow plots where we grew nothing mm -hmm. um, to look at both the weed pressure uh, and the yield. And we um, definitely saw kind of gaps in the soybeans where right. you, we had our fallow plots. And, right. and so uh, that was really great to see. Um, what like percentage of um, yield increase did you see? Yeah, so the national average for soybeans um, last year was right around, I believe, like 52 bushels per acre. Mm -hmm. um, and we had some plots that were above 70. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. 
All right. So you were also um, doing some variety trials. Is that still going on? Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to continue to do variety trials every year because every year we're getting new genetics and more varieties mm-hmm. and more availability, especially now with the passing. Um, it's actually in some places it's harder to get seed now because now we have to provide um, or they have to provide the export permits where in the past we had to work on the import permits where we don't need those anymore. So it's kind of, there has been some relationships, but it's been more difficult to get seed. Um, oh, okay. And, uh, but other places, you know, all across Europe and things, it's actually quite easy to find varieties that we can get a hold of. So um, kind of figuring out where we can get seed from and, and certified seed sources is, is key. Um, so we're going to continue to try those varieties. But really what we're doing here is we're looking at the different varieties and their potential, really to see which varieties are producing good biomass for us and, and good height to use into our rotation. And so we're going to continue to test those um, we're also looking a little bit into some dual purpose varieties because what's so great about hemp is that it has all of these uses. So if sure. we can get kind of a dual purpose out of one harvest, um, that would be ideal. But of course, we're behind on machinery, processing equipment. And so uh, that's kind of the hold up on some of those really awesome dual purpose varieties. And that would be what, like a fiber grain variety? Is that the, yeah. the dual purpose? Yeah, so it's, it's still giving you a good amount of height and biomass. Um, but it's producing grain all at the same time. And so those to me have a lot of potential, um, but of course they require specialized equipment. And, and those combines do exist in other parts of the world that never stopped growing industrial hemp, right. where you, you have a combine coming through and taking the grain off the top and the stalks um, and, and, and stripping the fiber off the bottom. And so that's, you know, kind of a seamless system, but, you know, those machines are anywhere from one to $3 million. And so... We're not quite there yet. (laughs) Have you heard from equipment manufacturers who are like trying to figure this out for the U.S. market? Yeah, I haven't, you know, there's, there's no confirmation for sure, but, um, you know, there's definitely been talk of some of our big companies like New Holland and John Deere working on those things. Um, we know that they have the potential and the capacity to do so, but they also have to look at their market and see, um, if it's worth it to produce, uh, such, uh, an expensive, unique piece of equipment because right now we're so heavily saturated in the CBD industry. So, um, you know, seeing if if the industrial side is, is going to catch up and, you know, kind of matching the processing and the equipment available to the the need um, uh, right. for, for that. Yeah. Um, so how did you harvest this year? I know... Uh, Last year, I talked to your former farm manager who sort of told the story of the first harvest in 2017, and it was nearly a calamity, but then somebody came in with a sickle bar mower and sort of made short work of it. How are things progressing there harvest-wise now? Yeah, we really liked how the sickle bar mower went, so we went ahead and we purchased one of those, and they really are uh, fairly priced on the market and easily accessible. Um, I think they really work great uh, for a being able to, um, you know, harvest the, especially those really thick, uh, fiber varieties where Mm -hmm. those stems are so incredibly woody. Um, so you're able to kind of adjust how low you cut as well, um, whether you want to leave double or not, um, you know, and, and they lay it down really nicely and you're able just to bail it up because processors are going to want that fiber in, in bales. Um, and so that kind of works really great for us. And, and we've continued to use that for um, our fiber varieties. For the grain variety, um, we did grow a variety specifically for grain this year. Uh, unfortunately, trying to play around the different with the different agronomic factors, like providing them more space mm-hmm. to branch out and produce more buds, um, allowed opportunity for weeds to come through in another wet year. Uh, okay. um, so when we did try to, we did, we were able to run our plot combine um through there uh and it was able to handle the woody stems because with the with the seed varieties um, they're getting done a little bit quicker they're not growing as tall and they're not growing as thick of stems it was able to handle them um and it was getting the grain off however it was very mixed with weed seeds and uh, right. there, there was no good way to to sort them um and then also one other issue with hemp and i think it's just something that we're going to have to work with is 
is the uniformity, there really isn't any. So to grow a field, like with, you'll see a, you know, a wheat field or an oat field, and they're all the same height. Right. So you come in at one height and you harvest. That's not the case with hemp. It's just so variable. Within one treatment in one plot, we had plants that were six inches and plants that were six feet. Um, so really narrowing down that, that uniformity. I think we can narrow it down um, with how we grow it and with breeding and things like that. Um, but it's going to take a lot of work. But I know in other countries, the equipment itself is adapted to the uniqueness of this plant. So okay. they actually use lasers to adjust <sighs> to be able to harvest at lasers, each height. Right. Um, yeah. <laughs> so that's uh, there. that equipment does exist, uh, just not here. Cool. Yeah. So what sort of practical lessons did you learn this year that you could share with other hemp growers? Yeah, I'd say first and foremost... Um, that we've learned is that the tighter that you can tack the hemp, the better the quality and the, you know, reduction of weed pressure. So we were getting up to 50 pounds per acre and we were seeing great results there, not only with the weed suppression, um, but the field is growing more uniform, which is really helpful in harvest. Um, and you're getting thicker stems, more fiber content and a higher fiber quality. Um, okay. So that's, that's really great if you're growing for fiber. Um, we, you know, are still learning how to grow the green varieties. We know that typically you want to give them a little bit more space to branch out and produce more buds. However, we have to figure out how to combat the weed pressure hmm. um, with providing those gaps and those spaces. Um, right now, there isn't a great way to cultivate other than blind um, cultivation and it will just, or just creating a stale seed bed before you plant the hemp because the hemp is being planted so shallow at a quarter to a half inch mm. that, you know, any cultivation is, is ripping out um, any of those seedlings. So sure. it's, you know, right now that's really difficult to find cultivation that works. We might look into, there might be other methods. Um, we are getting a flame leader, um, things like that uh, for the potential to cultivate in between those rows. Okay. Um, but for the most part, we're letting hemp do its job. So the best way to do that is to plant it as tight as possible. Okay. Um, now, some listeners might not be aware of the work that Rodale has been doing over the past four decades. Can you talk a little yeah. bit about those sort of side-by-side -side trials with organic versus conventional? Yeah, sure. So in 1981, we began our first major trial. And this has become known as our farming systems trial. Uh, really, this started as a way to look at the process of transitioning from conventional to organic agriculture. Um, it was going to look at the soil health and how that changes over time during the transition, um, as well as yield, weed pressure, um, and then also the economics of it all, your, your inputs versus your output and your overall profit. Um, and so what we saw is that our yields were comparable in organic versus conventional. I mean, many people will tell you when you try to talk about organic agriculture that it won't allow us to feed the world. But we have 40 years of data that shows that it does. And not only that, um, but you are creating a system that is more resilient. So it's able to adapt and fight things like pest pressure that comes through. I mean, there's different insects every couple of years that come through um, and can be a major problem, um, of course, until they find something to uh, find some way to kill it. But if you create a naturally resilient system, an ecosystem, uh, they find their own way to, you know, hmm. adapt to those changes. Right. And specifically in uh, 95 and 96 and 2015 and 2016, we had years of drought, um, pretty severe drought. And what we saw there is actually the organic yields uh, were much higher than the conventional yields in, mm. in years of drought. So again, that's by creating that more resilient system um, by allowing the ecosystem to function in, you know, in a natural way. Okay. Um, and, you know, so that's kind of what we've, that's how it started um, we have added things in there. We try to keep track and keep up with the industry. So in our conventional systems, we have incorporated things like GMO seed um, and try to use the different sprays that farmers are using now. We also, in 2008, added in um, no-till treatments. Um, no-till or reduced tillage has been um, you know, increasing in both organic and conventional farming. And so really to look at um, the effects that that has on the soil health and the system as a whole and, and the overall yield. Um, and so that's kind of the work that we do. But we're, we're working now on, on taking it a step further. 
Um, so really all that we do is based on this mission that our founder wrote on a chalkboard in 1947, that healthy soil equals healthy food equals healthy people. Well, we've really worked the last 40 years on, on connecting the health of the soil to the health of the food. But now we really need to dive into the actual health of the food. We want to show that organic uh, produce and, and grains are more nutritious. So like, you know, testing the actual nutrients. And so we're really, you know, doing that with hemp from the start. Um, and and we're really getting into that now by adding our, our vegetable systems trial, which is the same thing, a side-by-side -side comparison of organic and conventional agriculture um, but in this case, it's with vegetable crops. And so looking at the difference in the nutrients uh, for those two systems. So those are systems trials and, and monitoring the system as a whole. Okay. And um, yeah, so uh, we've kind of tried to take it a step further from that. Um, you know, that was really looking about sustaining the yield, the population. But now we're really delving into regenerative organic agriculture. It's a term that we've been saying for a very long time, but how do we accomplish that? So really, um, you know, narrowing down the details of the central practices of regenerative organic farming, like cover cropping, um, natural use of fertilizers like compost, crop rotation, and reduced tillage. Mm -hmm. And those four pillars um, are, you know, the industrial hemp work that we're doing is kind of mirroring that. And, and so using hemp to fit and to kind of create a model for this regenerative organic system. Okay. Actually, my next question was, yeah, how does hemp fit into that overall mission of the Institute? But I think you just answered yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We really think that it, it has this great potential, you know, along with other crops. So, you know, using this crop, you know, people are saying, we know that hemp is potentially, you know, this great new miracle crop. It has all these uses. Um, over 25,000 uses, um, and and I think also just the sheer interest and excitement of having a new crop. Uh, however, we wanted to treat it like any other crop because that's that's what it is, um, and and see how it's going to fit into a farmer's existing plan and benefit them. And so, really taking this and plugging it in to diversify your crop rotation and provide some agroecosystem services. Um, and, you know, to ultimately increase farmer income, because the hope is that by incorporating hemp into your rotation, um, you'll be able to make a higher profit. And, and that's the hope. Right. Um, so the Rodale Institute is a general resource for farmers, not only in Pennsylvania, but in the world. What's uh, the sort of the best way for people to get in touch with the folks there at the Rodale Institute? Yeah, sure. So the, you know, just to kind of get a basis, we have a lot of information on, we have over 20 research projects looking at all of these different things in many different ways. And so kind of delving a little bit into the information that we provide on our website. But we also have, if you're a farmer or someone interested in farming and looking uh, to grow organically or to transition organic, we do um, now have our organic crop consultant. Um, and so uh, we were the first, actually, ahead of USDA to hire an organic crop consultant um, and, and to help to help that transition for someone to be there um, and help you through that. And so um, contacting our institute, um, all the information is on our website, but the most simple way is just to email info at rodaleinstitute.org. Okay. Um, and so you know, that kind of gets you started and they will kind of put you in the right direction. Um, but there are many contacts on the website itself. Uh, you could call our main line um, and they'll get you in contact with the right people. Uh, Great. To, to kind of give you the information and, and, you know, teach you what we've learned so far. <laughs> All right. Good. Well, uh, Tara, Caton, thank you very much for your time today. Yes, of course. So a couple of years ago, I made a video of the hemp trials at the Rodale Institute, and you can see that side-by-side -side trial with the sorghum Sudan grass next to the, the fallow plot next to the industrial hemp. You can see how, how great the weed control is. I will put a link to that on the show page for this episode. All right, next up is my interview with Eric White, also known as the Wild American on Instagram. Uh, last week, he sent me some photos of hemp plants that were severely damaged by European corn borers. 
So I got in touch with him, and we had the following conversation. Eric White, welcome to the Lancaster Farming Industrial Hemp Podcast. Could you introduce yourself for us a little bit? My name is Eric White. I am a farmer from the Poconos, Pennsylvania. Uh, we're located right right in the Delaware Water Gap area. Uh, we have an organic farm, and we are growing hemp here for CBD, and uh, it's going really well. Okay. Um, how many acres are you growing up there? We have a 43-acre farm uh, that has about 35 tillable acres, of which we have five acres in the ground. And have you started harvesting yet? We have. We're, we're kind of taking the slow and steady approach, uh, working through. I've actually invited the, a lot of people from the community to come in on the weekends, and I've been walking through the fields and uh, really taking our time, looking for plants that are really showing that they're ready. We have been certainly blessed with an incredible growing season. And uh, yeah, this little mini drought that we're experiencing right now is perfect. So we're not in any rush. Right. Okay. Um, Can you talk a little bit about the varieties you're growing? Yeah. The varieties that we're growing here are uh, T2, which is from uh, the Boring Hemp Company. Uh, We, we've had some, some real, some luck with that uh, variety. And uh, we had a variety that we brought in from uh, Oregon that is actually going to be named after um, the smokable products that, that we're making. Uh, we had, out of 50 people that grew his variety, he was uh, the happiest with ours. Oh, wow. And uh, so he named it, uh, we're, our smokables are going to be called uh, Wild Americanas. So he named that variety um, the Americana after us. On Instagram, you're known as the Wild American. That is that is true. I <laughs> I, spent, I spent a lot of time living overseas where that uh, Instagram name made a little bit more sense. But uh, that's uh, that's where they, that's what they called me in Iraq. So that's where <laughs> the Instagram name came from. Okay, so you do have a fascinating backstory, which we don't really have time to get into here. But listeners should definitely check out. Uh, the Hemp Entrepreneur podcast uh, from August 14th. It's a great show that uh, Drew and Cameron from Coexist Build and Amerishandra produce each week. They do a great show and they, they get into some really great stories, yours included. Fascinating stuff. Yeah, those are those are the greatest guys that uh, I've met out in this business and uh, definitely hope that people can support them and check that out. Yeah, this uh, hemp industry is bringing together a, a whole lot of people who are just in it to share information and experiences. It's, it's really um, kind of wonderful. It really is. I uh, had a great turnout this weekend and we're doing it again, um, or last weekend and we're doing it again this neat weekend. And uh, I just kept saying the same thing. I'm, I'm, I guess that my um, the best, the best thing about this business so far has been uh, the new friends that we've made and uh, the support that we're getting from from everyone. So, amen to that. So, um, let's talk a bit about your your crop. Um, have you had, you know, weed pressure or pest pressure? What what's going on, you know, on the ground out there? Well, so yeah, we're we're an organic farm here. It's been an organic farm uh, for over 120 years, and. Uh, I took it over this year and have adopted the same practices as the the farmer before me. Uh, so we've been really trying to just keep a close eye on on any pests that come in because we don't have the option of you know essentially spraying for them. Um, and uh, we have been really lucky. As soon as we saw aphids come in, uh, which was was early on, uh, the literally the, the the next day it seems like the the ladybugs showed up and the praying mantises showed up, and uh, we've been. We've been really lucky. Uh, again, it's a, a great year. Some of our plants are incredibly uh, too close, <laughs> planted too close together. Oh, okay. We di- we direct seeded a lot of our our plants. Mm-hmm. Um, we over uh, you know over seeded, thinking that there would be not a, as good of a germination rate, and it was incredible. So mm-hmm. a lot of plants are touching, and you know um, we had a lot of trouble just keeping after the the weeds and the grass around the plants. And I mm-hmm. think that was where the problem started. Uh, I've been doing a lot of research on the only uh, real pest that we've found that's been any kind of problem, and that was the European corn borer. We didn't even know we had the problem until the bud development kicked in and the plants, the branches were getting a little bit heavier, and then they started breaking. So I would find, you know, big you know, beautiful bud filled branch just laying in the middle of the laying in the middle of the ground and one of the rows, um, sometimes still connected, 
uh, and still alive because this is mm-hmm. a really hardy plant. But sure. um, uh, what it, what you could see around the um, the branch and the, where the branch meets the stem is a lot of little tiny holes and a lot of sawdust looking uh, what turned out to be excrement from the from the uh, from the bug. Okay. So. Uh, we we started checking all the plants, and um, it seems like this little guy is everywhere this year. In all of your plants, or a lot of them, or what? Yeah, on the on the well, we have a couple different parcels, um, and on the the one particular parcel that we direct seeded and did have quite a bit of foxtail growing around it. Mm-hmm. Every other plant, maybe every plant, wow. uh, we could see that there was either. A little bit of scarring, uh, so you look like a. You can see the stalk is growing, and then there'll be a knuckle where it had some trauma, and that trauma would have been the uh, the the caterpillar boring in there, right. and then the plant kind of heals itself around it. But uh, yeah, there's there's quite a bit of uh, damage. Um, well, I think stress to the plant, and not so much damage, because of course we can't really tell um, if the you know the plant was going to have larger buds if those weren't in there, Mm. but we imagine so. And uh, that's actually why I reached out to you because I was really, I was really interested in getting the the hemp, the Pennsylvania hemp community to kind of, um, you know, fill me in on what they know and talk about potential solutions. And hopefully we can get ahead of this next year because everything I've read says it'll just, you know, it gets worse every year. Yeah. Um, A guest I had on the show a few weeks ago, Dr. Chris Tipping from um, Delaware Valley University. He's an entomologist who actually specializes in the European corn borer, and he's the head of the hemp research program at Del Val. Yeah, he, he gave out his phone number, I believe. Right. And I was going to reach out, and that's actually why it was fresh on my mind when I saw this. I, I sent you those pictures because mm-hmm. I thought, uh, you know, it'd be something of interest. And and what I read was it was, you know, one of the, the biggest pests uh, for the hemp industry in years right. past as well. And yep. I think he had mentioned that as, as well. Yeah. Um, do you mind if I share some of those pictures on our Instagram page? Absolutely. Please do. Okay. And yeah, I believe his email address was christopher.tipping at delval.edu. And he, yeah, he put it out there. Like if anyone has questions, get in touch with him uh, because he's an entomologist and uh, yeah, could have some solutions for you. Uh, but you're also sort of asking for organic solutions too. So if any other listeners have some ideas or, you know, they've had success with certain methods, um, we can all get together. Either send me an email, podcast at LancasterFarming.com, or what's the best way to reach you, Eric? Yeah, the best way to reach me is Instagram, I guess. And if you don't have Instagram, uh, you can email me at eb at penleaders.com. Okay, E as in Eric, B as in bravo, at penleaders.com. Okay, great. Well, how about uh, like sort of after harvest? What's your sort of marketing plan for your crop? So we just got a, uh, another test back. We've been testing about every five days, and our THC levels are at the highest that we've had is 0.17, oh. so half the legal limit, and really excited about that because we're just going to keep letting these things uh letting these things develop. Um, uh, we're going to cut them down, throw them in the barn, and then we're building a uh, drying facility right behind the barn out of store, uh, shipping containers. Oh, okay. We're going to finish them in the shipping containers just so we have a little bit more control there. Mm-hmm. And then we are going to be rolling some artesian kind of small batch uh, canagars, which are hemp hemp cigars. Okay. We're doing the smokables as well. Yep. Thinking about doing uh, a little bit of this... Uh, the resin, I don't know if you've, or you're familiar with that, but... Yeah, tell me about it. They have a machine called a, a Nug Smasher, where you can take a, a fresh bud and uh, kind of hydraulic press it and get the, the resin out of it, and then mixing that at uh, the local coffee shop so that you have the option of having a very fresh... And in, it's, in, it's extracted in front of you, essentially. Wow. Well, we're kind of flipping the process. Instead of extracting it all here and then bringing the oils out to uh, the market, we're going to try and uh, extract the oils right in front of people and give them a little bit better of an experience there. Okay. So when you say fresh bud, you mean not even dried? Um, well, no, it'll be dried. Yeah. Okay. It's dried and cured, but okay. you can do it with a fresh bud too. You guys want to stop by, you're more than welcome. <laughs> okay. So you said your farm's up in the Poconos. Um, what is that? East, 
East Stroudsburg? Is that where you are? It is East Stroudsburg, yeah. We're the first exit off of Route 80 in Pennsylvania, right through the uh, Delaware Water Gap Bridge. Okay. Yeah, we're uh, we're up on the hill looking at the Delaware Water Gap. It's a, it's a gorgeous spot. Oh, it sounds like it. Um, and so the name of your, your hemp operation? The name of the hemp operation is uh, Colt Organics. And uh, you can get a better idea of why we named it that if you listen to uh, Cam and Drew's podcast. Okay. But uh, yeah, and the uh, the smokables will be the Wild Americana. Okay. And you said occult organics. That's correct. All right. And those um, hemp cigars, will they be rolled with tobacco? No, no. They'll be rolled with uh, hemp leaves and with that resin that we talked okay. about. So they'll have resin and hemp leaves and uh, hemp inside. Yeah. All right. So it'll just be a little bit of a twist. You're out on the golf course and everybody, you know, pulls out their cigar and you can pull out uh, something a little bit different. See how quickly you get it kicked off the course. Yeah. <laughs> right. All right. Is there anything else you want to share with our listening audience today? No, not no. Only that uh, we really, really, really appreciate what you're doing, Eric. And uh, thanks to Lancaster Farming and uh, the, the community that we're creating here. And I uh, look forward to many more years. All right. Eric White, the Wild American at Occult Organics. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I will put a link to the Hemp Entrepreneur podcast interview uh, with Eric White. I'll put that link right on the show page for this episode. And also be sure to check out our Instagram page, LF Podcast Hemp, and you can see some of those corn borer damage photos. All right. Thank you. All right. Well, that does it for me this week. Thank you for listening. Uh, One more shout out to our sponsors for the summit, Kimberton Whole Foods and Pocono Organics, plus our musical sponsors, the Pennsylvania Hemp Industry Council and Floyd's of Leadville. Thank you all so much. My name is Eric Harlock. I'm the digital editor at Lancaster Farming, the best agricultural newspaper in the world, as I've mentioned before. Uh, You should become a subscriber. It's not too late. We still are accepting subscribers. Go to LancasterFarming.com slash podcast deal. And here's the kind of thing that you get as a subscriber. Uh, We just published a hemp special section. It's called Hemp. The sky's the limit. And it's a 16-page, you know, section with lots of great stories, some of which are based on podcast interviews. Uh, But my editorial team worked really hard to put this together. And the ad sales team also worked really hard to get lots of great advertisers in it. Lots of things from the hemp space. So if you go to the summit, you can um, be able to pick up a copy of this hemp special section. All right, that does it for me. Until next time, I'll see you in the newspaper. industrial hemp. This episode of the Lancaster Farming Industrial Hemp Podcast, episode 52, is copyright 2019 by Lancaster Farming, which is part of the Steinman Communications family. Today's show was written and recorded, edited and produced by yours truly, Eric Harlock. Thank you all for listening. Any music you hear is courtesy of Tin Bird Shadow, who you might know by now will be appearing at the 2019 Pennsylvania Hemp Summit happening in October, October 7th, for the Tin Bird Shadow. Get your tickets now. Don't want to miss this. <laughs>